you enjoy bizarre true stories, then the Useless Information Podcast is the podcast for you. For example, did you know that author Robert Louis Stevenson gave his birthday away? Or that there was a football team that played for six years before someone realized that the school never, ever existed? Or that a dog in upstate New York was once placed on trial for murder? Well, to hear these and hundreds of additional fascinating true stories from the flip side history, be sure to check out the Useless Information Podcast. That's the Useless Information Podcast, podcasting worldwide since 2008 and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Be sure to check it out. Parents, did you know there are podcasts for kids? I'm here to tell you about mine, What If World. I answer what if questions with wild and funny stories. Tell them how What If World has a huge cast of magical characters. Okay, I was... And how each story has a positive message. Yeah, I... Yar, what If World is great for bedtime, car rides, or whenever kids just need to unplug. <laughs> you can find What If World on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where a lack of seriousness meets Jeff. A little bit of knowledge? That's correct. Yes. You got it Woo-hoo. on the first try. You are very knowledgeable indeed. That never happens. Uh, it's me, Jeff, and Neil in the studio. We are sans Matt. Sad. Yeah, we're sad. Where where is Matt? Ken, I think he's he's, said... he's in the sands, uh, trying to discover the tomb of Tutankhamun, but it's already been discovered. So, so he's just looking at a bunch of dirt and yeah. sand. It's we, probably we told like a, him a bunch of the good artifacts in the British Museum. We told him it was already discovered. He didn't listen. He went anyways. He keeps asking people where Brendan Fraser is. We say, well, he's <laughs> on he's, the awards he's, trail. He's, he's on, on his whale. way back. Yeah. He's yeah. trying to win an Academy Award for Can't the whale. Wait till you to see him up on that stage. I know. I hope so because we said it's the. Uh, the, the Renaissance. The Renaissance. Indeed. That's right. What's your favorite Brendan Fraser movie, by the way? Um, Bedazzled. That is a good one, Jeff. Blast from the Past. That's Bedazzled another good one. Bedazzled is sneaky funny. Bedazzled is sneaky funny. 110%, right? Where 110%. He's the be- yeah. that, that's the best. And Sino Man's a great one, too, but uh, I, I got I love The Mummy. He's just so good in The Mummy, so I got to give it to him there. Shout out to Brendan Fraser. I'm sure, I'm sure he's listening. Yeah, I hope he is. Yeah, one day he'll come on the show. But yep. uh, other than Brendan Fraser, we have some great guests here uh, in his place. Uh, both of them have also, I assume, fought mummies and uh, hung out with Polly Shore, but we'll find out uh, in a minute. Our first guest uh, is uh, in a long line of people that we've been thanking over the last 10 episodes that have helped us get to 300, and the reason we are thanking them is because they are our first patrons, and this person joined Patreon October 20th, 2017, wow. uh, one of our first 10 patrons ever, uh, which we are so appreciative of. He's a savage superstar uh, on Patreon from Brooklyn, New York, our friend Dave Nelson. How are you, Dave? And I'll say a heck of a guy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good, fellas. How you doing? Good. Good. Now, uh, Dave, uh, we want you to remind the folks at home uh, what you're up to. But I do want to say uh, when we were in New York recently, when uh, Colleen and I got engaged, Jeff was there. Uh, when Jeff and everyone left, I was walking down the street with Colleen and we were trying to catch a train. And I was like, I think I saw Dave Nelson angrily walking somewhere. <laughs> and it ended up being you going into work, I think. Was that right? Uh, that's right. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I, I work uh, right near 42nd Street where I think uh, you were stalking oh my God, me. That's so funny. Did you catch him or no? No, well, it was right by Bryant Park, and we were trying to catch the train. And then when he, when he went back, I'm like, I, I told Colleen, I was like, I think that's Dave Nelson, uh, one of our friends and listeners. And she's like, Oh, there, maybe, maybe it is, but don't bug him. He's like walking to work. Is he and, just cursing under his breath? And he just said, Oh, that those triviality boys. And, and the funny thing is, that's the best celebrity Neil saw the entire time we were there, despite the fact that we saw Famke Jansen. And after we left, you guys saw who? Oh, the Jonas Brothers. So the Jonas wow. Brothers. I almost peed in the same <laughs> stall as Nick Jonas <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, right. Well, then, then I probably would have been arrested for TMZ. But um, so, Dave, uh, that was you. Uh, you live in New York. Uh, you're a man about town. But tell people at home uh, what you're up to over there. Sure. Um, still doing the same uh, stuff I've been doing. I work as a lawyer for a, uh, a Japanese company or their office here in New York. I uh, started hosting trivia at a local bar a couple months ago, sort of by accident. So um, some of these questions you'll hear tonight have come from uh, quizzes I've given there. Some of them are uh, are new, but uh, hopefully all of them will be fun to answer. And we have some listeners in Brooklyn. Um, any uh, shout out for the for the bar if they want to come play? Sure. Yeah. We, every other Tuesday night, we're at the Sackett Bar in Park Slope, Brooklyn, uh, just off of Fourth Avenue on Sackett Street. 
kick off around eight o'clock and uh it's a good time swing by i've been told a lot of the best things start by accident this podcast my parents said that i was an accident so you know i'm pretty happy no, that's that's good, Jeff. Well, we, we we don't think you're an accident. We we love you here. Um, but yeah, all of our Brooklyn well, listeners, go say hi to. <laughs> well, maybe not. We'll, we'll keep up appearances for the show. Uh, but Dave, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and we're so excited um, to introduce our next guest. Uh, there really is no introduction that can do him uh, do him service. But and you've heard him on more episodes than, than any other else person besides the four of us. That's true. Well, actually, and, more than Matt. We we had a we had a wishing well. Ken uh, bought the, a book uh, called The Secret. Uh, Jeff had a, a manifestation wall. We've been trying to get him on the show forever, and we're so excited to have him here. The stars aligned. The stars aligned. Uh, coming to us from Rockford, Illinois, uh, none other than uh, the rules guy himself, Darren Marlar. How are you, Darren? Well, hey there. Thank, thank you very much. It's so great to be here with Famke Jensen and the Jonas Brothers. I really appreciate you guys bringing me on. So this is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> We're so, so excited. Or, or, or is that the accident? Am I on the wrong? Is that, am I on the wrong podcast? <laughs> now, Darren, does does Neil stalk you uh, as well? <laughs> well? If he does, he's really good at it because I have yet to catch him. He is good. <laughs> okay. I know. I've he's only I've only changed the shirt of the werewolf statue behind Darren once without him knowing. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, a great great call for an audio podcast there, Neil. Yeah, yeah, Neil's really good so at that. People will love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what we try to do here. Stay professional. Uh, but Darren, um, so everyone knows your voice. You, you've you've done our intro. You've done our rules for uh, mm-hmm. five years yeah. now. But uh, tell people about you. Goodness gracious! Have I been dealing with you guys for five years? You only wow. had to deal with with us the one time to record this stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, yeah. Thanks for taking the fun out of it. Yeah, okay. you're breaking uh, the fourth wall, Ken. Oh, yeah, sorry, he does it live. Yeah, 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 he does it live every week. Too late now. Yeah, I, I've done the Australian accent. And yeah. Um, uh, actually, uh, I am the host of my own podcast. It's called Weird Darkness. And uh, if you like stuff like the paranormal, the supernatural, true crime, extraterrestrials, unsolved mysteries, all of that strange and macabre stuff, uh, I do an episode seven days a week there. And uh, I am also a professional voice artist, which is, I, th- I think, how how you, you and I guys, how, how we all met. Uh, was just through that aspect of what I do. And so I'm here all day long in front of a microphone doing my thing uh, outside of Rockford, Illinois, about 90 miles northwest of Chicago. And I love my job. This is what I do full time, uh, hanging out with guys like you and and voicing stuff like what you guys have asked for. I love doing that movie trailer guy that you asked for. Uh, that's one of my favorite things that people ask me to do. And uh, speaking of all the great work that you do, uh, is there anywhere people can find you if they'd like to hire you for uh, something of their own? Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, uh, you can find the podcast at WeirdDarkness.com, and there is also a place there. Uh, there's one of the pages where you can uh, – it'll take you to it's kind of like a demo site of everything that I've done, a lot of YouTube videos of me doing the various voices where you can hire me from there. So, yeah, if you just remember WeirdDarkness.com, that's probably the easiest way to go. I appreciate you telling me. You tell the people that. Thanks. Of course. We want to uh, help to support you and get people to uh, interact with you as well. And and uh, although we don't have a podcast called Weird Darkness, that's what happens in the studio basically after we record every time. So. Yes, yes. It yeah. makes us feel very uncomfortable. I, I try. Um, well, Dave, you're hosting the game. Um, Darren uh, decided to uh, partner with me today, and since my voice is gone from being sick and it's still on the mend, and Darren has the golden voice, uh, we're going to be the voice and the voiceless. Yeah, and I'm sitting here across from Jeff, and I'm looking at a nicely scented candle sitting here in the studio, and it's called Sand and Fog. So we'll be Sand and Fog. Which one are you? Do the um, sand or the fog? I think Jeff would be sand. All right, I'll be the fog. I'm coarse. I'm gritty. Yeah, I get everywhere. Um, but uh, Ken, that's I'll, I'll call Kenneth has been drinking a lot, fog. so he's foggy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, Ken, I'll let you take it away because uh, we often say this every episode, but this is going to be the most special time we've ever said it before. Let's uh, toss it to the live rules. The rules of the game are simple. 20 questions split into two rounds worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there will be a special swing round designed by this week's host. After regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. 
And right, they all said, it won't be Neil and me. The cream of the crop. <laughs> the, cream the cream of the crop. crop. Awesome. That was so much Nobody fun. Nobody does it better. Uh, I think we're going to put in a good effort, uh, good effort, Darren. That was, so. that was so much fun for me. That like It tickled the part of my brain that did, I did not know existed. Yeah, that was so nice, Darren. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. It's been, been five years, but uh, hopefully for five years more, everyone will be hearing your, your golden pipes. So. And maybe we ought to refresh that. Yeah. After five years, maybe we ought to redo that. Yeah, maybe. I'll do it for free. Send, send me the script. I'll do it for you. Yeah, no, that'd be great. All maybe right. we'll we'll yeah. see, add some fun things. Like, yeah, I don't know what we'll do. We'll figure it out. Some slide whistles in the background. Something for 2023. <laughs> slide whistles. Uh, but, uh, Dave, because that's so 2023. Uh, now, Dave, I'm sure you're uh, in a lot of uh, courtrooms and, and uh, deposition rooms, possibly, or something. So you have to deal with, uh, you know, uh, nut jobs, kind of like all of us here talking. But uh, feel free to take it away and keep control of us, because uh, when it comes to trivia, Jeff, what's the catchphrase? Nobody does it better, Dutch boy. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, round one, question one. Shall we? Uh, so when I do my quizzes in the in the the pub, I like to start out with a few current events. Uh, these are sort of current dish events. Um, so uh, educator and social critic Kanye West has been in the news lately. Uh, his wildly anti-Semitic gibberish has cost him deals with The Gap, Chase Bank, creative artists, eventually Adidas, and also which Spanish fashion house whose mouth guards he was photographed wearing at Paris Fashion Week. All right, I wrote some... Uh, fast fashion that was Spanish, and then uh, uh, Jeff wrote some fashion fashion. So we're gonna go with Jeff's answer. Okay, so you're both locked in. So uh, Darren, do you have any uh, idea on this one? I have a guess, but I didn't know where your head was at. Uh, I have no no idea. So not a clue. Uh, I'm hoping we'll start off on the right foot here. I believe um, he had a deal with Balenciaga, which I believe is Spanish. So uh, we're gonna lock in with Balenciaga. Uh, yeah, we two went with Balenciaga. <laughs> The, the answer is Balenciaga. Well done. Nicely done, guys. All right. Question number two. Um, the U.S. Mint recently issued a new quarter commemorating the life of what Chinese-American actress of the 20s and 30s, making her the first Asian-American to appear on any U.S. coin or currency? Oh, we're locked in. That's great, because I'm usually the currency guy, but kind of had it right away. I can see your face, and I—I I don't know if there's a May in there. No, I can't remember. I—I'm I'm, going to just not sound good trying to figure this one out because I—I I, I used to know it, uh, but I, I just—I'm not pulling it. Um, Billy Bobby May Brown. Okay, yeah, we'll go Billy Bobby May Brown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this person's face was always plastered on the uh, homepage of the Criterion Channel when I'd flip it on. I believe it's Anna May Wong. That's right. Appearing in your the... soon, if she hasn't already, is Anime Wong. Nice. At least I got the May right. I knew it was something like that. You I got to watch right, more yeah. Criterion, Neil. I know, and I'm on the, the Criterion app quite a bit, but just don't watch a lot of the, the older older stuff. So yeah, I saw this announcement um, a while back, and I, I didn't realize they had never put an Asian-American woman on uh, any currency. So it's exciting. Mm -hmm. All right, question number three. A Lubbock, Texas pizzeria recently raised eyebrows after creating a novelty pizza containing fake blood, an eyeball, a dismembered finger, and ramen noodles simulating intestines in tribute to which historical figure recently portrayed by actor Evan Peters? We're locked in. You're locked in. Oh, it looks like you knew this one, Darren. I think I do, yeah. What do you yeah, think? This is kind of your biz, right? Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh, I like that. Uh, that's oh yeah, Evan Peters, right? He would have been in the uh, the miniseries. So it's yeah, the yeah, Netflix thing. Okay, yeah, well, let's go with Darren uh, with uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Yep, we said the same. Yep, it's Jeffrey Dahmer. I haven't seen the show yet, but I hear it's great. I also hear it's very gruesome. Yeah, it did really well. I think it was Netflix's highest rated uh, series oh, wow, of really? all time. Yeah, like very quickly. Yeah, jeez, a lot of people like gore, they're and they're making more. They're making more, yeah. Well, Whether they should or not, I don't know. Not for me to judge, but they're well, doing more. Yeah. There's certainly something they're interesting making... about the serial killer genre. They're making more Jeffrey Dahmer episodes, are you saying? No, they're they're uh, doing uh, different different figures. Pro like, like same, more like profiles in the discourage. serial killer cinematic universe. Pretty much. Question number four. Which president was the first one to keep house cats as pets? A pair of no doubt adorable kitties called Tabby and Dixie. 
He's also thought to have originated the presidential tradition of pardoning turkeys after granting clemency to a potential Christmas feast at the pleading of his 10-year-old son. I think I know this one. We can lock in if you want to uh, let these guys talk. Yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. There's a name that's stuck in my head, but I, I think it's completely wrong. It's just a name that popped in, so yeah. Okay, I'll let these guys talk. I know I've heard this question. I can't uh, I can't place it. Uh, Calvin Coolidge, maybe? Yeah. Is this I one of the weird Coolidge ones? I, I wonder about weird Coolidge ones because that would have been... Well, no, the Depression wouldn't have been going on Pre-depression. yet. Pre-Depression. So I wonder if it was like, was it Harding? Who wouldn't do it because it was like Depression era and I don't know. So choose or not Harding Hoover. Choose. Uh, Hoover. All right, Hoover. So this one, uh, the reason I was thinking about it was there's a West Wing episode where um, Bartlett has to pardon a turkey and uh, CJ is talking about how the tradition started and all that. And I always mix up if it's uh, Kennedy uh, was the first one to pardon a turkey, which wasn't too long ago. Um, and the other one is, um, oh, is Fillmore or not, but uh, I just went with Kennedy because it's stuck in my head. So, Well, you guys were a little bit uh, late on this one. This one uh, tradition goes all the way back to the great emancipator himself, Abraham Lincoln. Oh, wow. Wow. I wondered about Abraham Lincoln. I didn't even think about him at all on that. Wow. All right. Uh, question number five. In my past appearances here, I've demonstrated a mild obsession with the subject of Donald Trump's favorite movies. I first became interested in this field of study after reading an old New Yorker article that describes a journey aboard Trump's private jet from New York to Mar-a-Lago, during the course of which you'll remember he has his young son Eric put Bloodsport on the VCR and then fast forward through all the film's rich exposition to quote, get this two-hour movie down to 45 minutes. Well, I recently revisited this article and picked up a detail that I had earlier missed. Among the handful of passengers on the plane, along with Trump, Eric, and the article's writer, was which socialite? She was born outside of Paris, moved to New York City in 1991, and in July 2022, moved to Tallahassee, Florida. That's my guess. That's a good guess, and we're going to lock in. Okay, um, they're locked in. Darren, I, I can't think of a socialite that would have moved to New York in 91 and now lives in Tallahassee, Florida. Do you know any famous socialites other than like Paris Hilton? I don't know. The, uh, the only one that pops into my head is Imelda Marcos, but I think that would be before 91. Hmm. So I, I can't, th I can't. Yeah. You want, just want to go with that. Cause I can't think of anything better other than like Paris Hilton, which I know it's not that. Uh, we could both be wrong. Sure. Okay. Well, when you say she moved to Tallahassee, Florida, we think that it wasn't a traditional type of move. As in, uh, by choice. She was moved. Um, mm. And knowing oh. connections to this person, we guessed uh, Ghislaine Maxwell. Well, that's right. She was moved to Tallahassee, Florida, more specifically mm. to FCI Tallahassee or uh, Federal Correctional Institution Tallahassee. This is uh, Trump's friend and uh, Bill Clinton's friend and uh, Jeffrey Epstein's favorite uh, sex procurer, Ghislaine Maxwell. I didn't wow. even hope he voluntarily moves from New York to Tallahassee. <laughs> right? I didn't even go in that direction. Wow, good good question, Dave. Um, after five <laughs> questions, uh, looks like uh, Team Sand and Fog in the lead with 30, and uh, the voice in the voice is still there with 20. Do you have 40? We have 40. Oh, I, I did mark 10 here. Yeah, you're right. I'm trying to take points away from you. You have. That's uh, right. You could try, but it's, it's the not fog help. is enveloping me like the John Carpenter movie. You actually have 40 points, and we have 20, so we have uh, double the work to, to get back up top. All right, well, question six. We're now quite solidly in the pumpkin spice season, perhaps even at the pumpkin spice equinox. <laughs> Good people at Starbucks introduced the pumpkin spice latte in 2003, and of course the drink became an immediate hit. Twelve years later, they announced that they were changing the recipe to include what new ingredient? We can lock in. So, Darren... Um... I think they're locking in quickly because I, I explained this to them at one point. I don't think it was on the air. I don't remember. But I believe they're actually putting pumpkin in the pumpkin spice latte, a very tiny percentage. Wow. What a concept. Yeah. You'd, you'd think they'd have it in there you know the entire what? That, time. That would actually make sense because sure enough, somebody <laughs> called a lawyer and complained 
and said, I, you know, you know, I want to sue Starbucks because they're saying pumpkin spice latte, but there actually is no pumpkin. That in is it. And exactly what happened, Darren. And I'm assuming they yeah, called that, Dave, that doesn't maybe. surprise me. I want me. to make it taste so, slightly yeah, I worse. Would go, yeah. <laughs> I putting real pumpkin in because, it. Because natural pumpkin tastes so great. Uh, <laughs> Um, Good source yeah, of fiber, though. I, I would totally go with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pumpkin. We'll, we'll lock, uh, yeah, pumpkin. lock that one in. We agree, and I think yes, it did make it to air. So did it? Okay. Yeah, you guys have, have uh, worked this one out quite easily. It is in fact pumpkin. Question seven: Among the all-time great NFL wide receivers to wear number eighty, was which Hall of Famer who ended his career with exactly one hundred touchdowns? and then went on to serve four terms in the U.S. House of Representatives before somehow losing as a Republican candidate for governor of Oklahoma. I don't know. Let's tap out. Sounds good. We'll clear the way. Hopefully Neil will figure it out here. Yeah. It's going to have to be you, Neil. Uh, so um, I believe uh, from my political knowledge, which I'm not so into politics, but um, I uh, follow a little bit, and I, I think this is a Seattle Seahawks receiver. Um, he had a, sort of a very... Um, Slimy, slick-backed hair as a as a politician, like so many of them before. But I believe it is—I uh, don't know his first name, but I think it's Largent, number eighty. Yeah, you got it. It's Steve Largent, four-time uh, representative from the state of Oklahoma. No way. Yeah, I think he played like 13, 14 seasons, something like that. I, I remember Steve Largent. I didn't realize he was a politician after that. Mm -hmm. Question eight: In December seventeen eighty. Which brand new British Brigadier General raided and captured the city of Richmond, Virginia on behalf of the Crown? I owe a huge apology to my social studies teacher. <laughs> uh, Jeff wrote down what I was thinking. We're on the same wavelength there. So now, we're going to lock in. Is it right? I we'll think so. Out. I think so. Seven, 1780, brand new Brigadier General. I don't know if brand new is a clue there, but. Um, I believe it's the only clue that Ken and I are going off of. Uh, I have no idea, Darren. I I don't know too much about Richmond, um, but not enough, at least, to to have a educated guess on this one. Do you know yeah, anything about if this? If I heard if I heard a name, I might be able to give it say yes or no. But I no, I, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, let's see. If you were if you were writing a uh, 1780 war epic, uh, just give me your your about best the, brigadier general name, uh, Darren. About the American Revolutionary <laughs> War. <sighs> Douglas. Douglas. I like Why it. Not? We'll go last name Douglas. How, I can't or first, or first. you're betraying yeah. your teammate like that. What? It's it's Marlar? You're being a cheeky bastard. Um, we think <laughs> that newly minted is because he was a potentially a turncoat, and we said Benedict Arnold. Mm. Yeah, this is a fellow who earlier in 1780 was uh, an officer in the Continental Army. By December 1780, he was in the British Army, uh, and this is Benedict Arnold. Ah, uh, okay. Goodness gracious, guys. Question number nine. It has been a huge year for cheating, with scandals in the worlds of poker, cornhole, and, of course, competitive walleye fishing. <laughs> of course. Additionally, <laughs> controversy swirled in the chess world as 19-year-old Hans Niemann was widely accused of having cheated against Norwegian Grandmaster Magnus Carlsen in a major tournament. No less an expert than Elon Musk himself weighed in on Twitter to endorse a wild theory that Niemann had cheated using a vibrating version of what device? I know this one, Darren. Okay. I know my vibrating devices, and we can lock in. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to touch that at all. Yeah, especially after where it's been. <sighs> I mean, I think we're not far off with these jokes, right? I don't. I don't. Wasn't think he so. using some sort of special, you know, mayhaps adult styled uh, toy? Yeah, I mean, it's possible that he could have been using a uh, vibrating phallic type <laughs> object, uh, which is typically used for the inducement of pleasure. I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> a Fitbit. Oh, I thought we were talking. I about... don't know what Elon, Elon Musk said. I thought he was. Uh... It's Elon Musk. He makes sixty nine and four twenty jokes. It yeah, probably was a dildo. Like, <laughs> like let's be honest. Like in his his estimation. Um, we don't know. We're gonna say he said it was a sex toy. Well, you can believe this, but the reason they thought that the guy had anal beads, 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to come on here and miss the opportunity to make somebody say anal beads out loud. So <laughs> uh, the answer is, in fact, anal beads. Was that even true? Yeah, he, you know, he puts his, you know, hand on the pond and go. <laughs> I think that's okay. what they were saying. Yeah. I mean, I should, I should also note that despite Mr. Musk's assertion, there is actually very little evidence to support this theory. Yes, thank you for clearing that. Oh, that's, oh, that's so surprising. How do you think I get my answers on this podcast? You mean there was no evidence? <laughs> All right, question number 10. Last question of the first round. Just to prove that uh, no one here is sexist, which team won the 2022 WNBA championship? 2022? 2022. I thought it was the, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Cool. Um, I, I mean, we can lock in over here, Darren. If you, if you trust me, I think I, yeah, yeah I, I don't, I don't follow basketball at all. Okay. The sky is dominant, so we're saying sky. Yeah, and it's maybe a, we're a year off, but yeah, definitely the Chicago sky was our guess. I think this guy won 2021 for sure, and they got like two or three rounds into the playoffs. I think the winners this year uh, were the uh, Vegas uh, Aces, I think they're called. But Vegas is our official answer. Yeah, that's right. The answer is the Las Vegas Aces. Nice. Well done. After the first round, uh, it looks like things have gotten a little bit closer, maybe too close for comfort uh, if it's uh, up to Ken, but uh, scores are at 60 to 60 right yeah, now. My, my device stopped working. Your device stopped working, which means uh, everything's on an even playing field now. Uh, and speaking of uh, a nice surprise, uh, we're looking for all of your questions for our 300th episode. So uh, if you'd like to join uh, some of the folks who have sent in an audio recorded question for our 300th episode, uh, you can do so with the link in the show notes. We have about five at this point. Uh, and what we're going to do for the 300th is we're going to listen to all the questions live. We, we have no idea what they are, what, what the, the clues are, anything like that. We're just going to play them on our soundboard here. And uh, if you'd like to send a nice message uh, about maybe when you started listening, or if you just want to you know, send over a question that's going to stump us, feel free to. And uh, we are excited to play it. Uh, and thank you uh, for helping us get to 300. So check out that link in the show notes, and uh, we will be happy to hear your question. What's uh, for the swing round today, Dave? What do you have in store? Well, just to keep the good vibrations going, uh, we're coming up on the 101st anniversary of the birth of one of the greatest Americans of all time, in my opinion, a man of the arts, a raconteur par excellence, whose persistence and late in life success will serve as a lesson to all for generations to come. I speak, of course, of Mr. Rodney Dangerfield. In tribute to the great man, this swing round will offer 10 of his best one-liners with the punchline omitted you all fill in the blanks. Number one, my wife and I, we never have sex. We get undressed and we can't stop blank. Number two, I know I'm ugly. My proctologist stuck his finger in my blank. Number three, my wife can't cook. She gave my kid alphabet soup. He spelled out blank. Number four, my father never liked me. When he took me hunting, he gave me blank. Number five, the other night my wife met me at the front door wearing a see-through negligee. The only trouble is she was blank. Number six, I came from a real tough neighborhood. On my street, the kids took hubcaps from blank. Number seven, my wife and I were happy for 20 years. Then we blank. Number eight, my wife and I, we don't think alike. She donates money to the homeless, and I donate money to the blank. Number nine, I come from a stupid family. During the Civil War, my great uncle fought for the blank. Number 10, my wife won a trip for two to Las Vegas. She went blank. All right. Those are the jokes. We'll come up with our best punchlines. Probably not as good as Rodney's, but uh, we'll be right back after these messages. Hey, it's Otis Gray. Do you have trouble falling asleep? Well, you should check out this podcast called Sleepy. It's where I read old classics and help you fall asleep. Best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. And that's it. So get tucked in, fluff up the cool side of your pillow, and take a one-way train down to Sleepy Town. Unless you're driving, then please don't listen to Sleepy. New episodes go out every Sunday, so you can get refreshed for your week. Subscribe to Sleepy wherever you get your podcasts. Sweet dreams. 
The Unbiased Science Podcast is devoted to objective, critical appraisal of evidence on health topics relevant to listeners' daily lives. I'm Dr. Jess Steyer, a public health scientist with expertise in public health policy, biostatistics, and advanced analytics. And I'm Dr. Andrea Love, an immunologist and microbiologist with expertise in infectious disease immunology, cancer immunology, and autoimmunity. And together, we are the hosts of the podcast. The goal of the Unbiased Science Podcast is to dispel misinformation and misconceptions across an array of science and public health topics. We love to debunk myths and help arm our listeners with information so they can make evidence-based decisions. We hope you'll tune in to the Unbiased Science Podcast, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science. New episodes air every other Wednesday, so make sure to mark your calendars. All right, we are back from our break. I think we came up with some pretty good jokes. If they're as good as Rodney's, uh, who could say? But uh, please give us the numbers again, and we're going to read out our jokes. All right, guys, let's hear number one. All right, number one, my wife and I never have sex. We get undressed, and we can't stop laughing. Uh, Again, the first one is, uh, my wife and I, we never have sex. We get undressed, and we can't stop gagging. Well, Rodney's joke was, uh, we get undressed, and we can't stop laughing. Mm, right. Oh, it was laughing. Oh, that's funny. All right, how about number two? I know I'm ugly. My proctologist stuck his finger in my mouth. Hey. <laughs> no respect. <laughs> I know I'm ugly. My proctologist stuck his finger in my belly button. I know I'm ugly, saith Rodney. My proctologist stuck his finger in my mouth. Wow. Number three, guys. My wife can't cook. She can't cook at all, people. She can't cook. Uh, she gave my kid <laughs> alphabet soup. He spelled out, help me. My wife can't cook. She gave my kid alphabet soup. He called out, call 911. Uh, number three, my wife can't cook. She gave my kid alphabet soup, and he spelled out, help. Hmm. Are we getting points for help me? Uh, and the other team said, call 911 or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll give you both points as it's basically in the spirit of the joke. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, that's so nice. That's so gracious. Number four. My father never liked me. When he took me hunting, he gave me antlers. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> My father never liked me. When he took me hunting, he gave me a head start. <laughs> that's pretty that's, good, too. I think that's really good. Number four, when he took me hunting, he gave me a head start. Yeah, when I heard good that, job, I buddy. thought... I thought for sure Darren nailed that. I was like, that's a perfect punchline. Nice job, Darren. Number five. My wife met me at the door in a negligee. Only thing is, she was at my brother's house. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. Uh, Ours is, my wife met me at the door in a negligee. The only thing is, she was coming home. (laughs) My wife met me at the front door wearing a see-through negligee. The only trouble is, she was coming home. Nice, Darren. Yes. I think mine is funnier though. <laughs> what do you guys have for six? I came from a tough neighborhood. On my street, the kids took hubcaps from cop cars. Not Ooh. that funny, but yours is really funny. <laughs> I came from a tough neighborhood. On my street, the kids took hub cups, hubcaps from moving cars. I like that. That's good. Yeah, on Rodney Street, the kids took hubcaps from moving cars. <laughs> Nicely done. Yes. <laughs> I actually wrote down cop cars first, too. Number seven. My wife and I were happy for 20 years. Then we got married. My wife and I were happy for 20 years. Then we had sex. <laughs> <laughs> those those are both good. I think Rodney's slightly more elegant. My wife and I were happy for 20 years. Then we met. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best. That is good. Yes. <laughs> See, I don't mind losing to that kind of a joke. <laughs> All right, number eight, guys. That's great. My wife donates money to the homeless. I donate to the sperm bank. My wife donates money to the homeless. I donate to the sperm bank. Yeah, not not bad, but I think you'll like Rodney's better. Um, He says he he and his wife don't think alike. She donates money to the homeless, and I donate money to the topless. (laughs) (laughs) Number nine. All right, both, both teams came up with really funny answers, I think. I come from a stupid family. During the Civil War, my great uncle fought for the Germans. (laughs) (laughs) 
I come from a stupid family. During the Civil War, my great uncle fought for the West. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right. During the Civil War, Rodney's great uncle fought for the West. Nice. Uh, wow. Way to go, Neil. <laughs> I got to say, I love the answer of the <laughs> during the during the Zoom I admit quiz, the Germans is better. <laughs> during the Zoom quiz, uh, somebody put down, um, my great uncle fought for the British. <laughs> I thought those this are, made me even better than Rodney. I think those are both good. All right, number 10. My wife won a trip for two to Las Vegas. She went by herself. My wife won a trip for two to Las Vegas. She went hooking. <laughs> Rodney said his wife won a trip for two to Las Vegas. She went twice. Nice. <laughs> I had alluded to that okay. as a possibility later. That's funny. All right, we only got three right there, but we had fun. After the swing round, uh, everyone's laughing in the studio, and uh, all for good reason, because uh, Team Sand and Fog picking up 15 points, bringing their total to 75, and uh, The Voice and the Voiceless picking up 30, bringing their total to 90. Laughing all the way to the bank. The sperm bank. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, right let's, twice. Let's start off round two with... Uh, one and... day, one of my Superman? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start off round two with everyone's uh, favorite topic, pencils. Uh, one of the best-selling pe models of pencils in the U.S. is which one, whose packaging humbly proclaims itself the world's best pencil, and which shares a name with a town in Essex County, New York? We can lock in, Ken. Oh, well, so it's not the graphite pencils. number. Oh, you were thinking of uh, number two? Yeah, but I guess that's yeah, you wouldn't call yourself your, call your town number two, not not if you wanted to have any... You know, anybody visiting. Yeah, right. I guess you've never been to Essex County, New York. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of, of pencil brands. It doesn't surprise me that Jeff knew immediately a pencil brand. Yeah, it is in, in, on brand with, with Jeff. Um, I hate pencils. I saw a YouTube a video guy. about pencils. <laughs> <laughs> this is you. It the does, real does sound a lot like me. The real question is, is there a brand that just just yellow? Yeah, maybe. Maybe yellow it's just pencils? yellow. I think there's a yellow. I think there's yellow notepads, but I don't know. I, I'm I'm th I'm seeing a name in my head, and it's not coming into focus. But um, I mean, yellow. You know, uh, it's better than anything I'm going to come up with. And all I was going to say is it maybe has John Voight's teeth indentations. But um, <laughs> yeah, let's go with yellow. Why not? If you're cool with that. Uh, it's just a little shot in the dark. Maybe it's because I was looking at Benedict Arnold on the other side of the paper, and I was thinking about cities that. Or remind me of the American Revolution, and we said Ticonderoga. Yep, the answer here is the Dixon Ticonderoga. Give me well a done. break. Wow. Come on. Uh, question, question number two. Newton's first law of motion describes the principle of, principle of inertia, that a body at rest tends to remain at rest, and a body in motion tends to remain in motion unless acted upon by a force. But which Italian, born in Pisa in 1564, is most often credited with originating the concept of inertia. Uh, I'm at a loss on this one, Neil. I have a very just basic yeah, guess. Yeah, go with your, your initial gut answer, Ken. Okay, we're locked in. Okay, so they're locked in. Um, I really have no bearing on this, uh, Darren. I, I, this isn't my wheelhouse, but um, I don't even know if he was Italian, but the, the first name that came to mind is, is just Galileo, but it could be the completely wrong time period. Well, Galileo would have been Italian, though. Yeah, so I don't know if... So, you know, does that seem like a reasonable guess, I guess? It's better than mine, which is nothing. So, yeah. All right. We're, we're, we'll go go Galileo. Yeah, we said Galileo as well. You both got it. It's uh, our friend Galileo. Don't want to wow. overthink it, you know. That's, I sh yeah, you're right. Should have just listened to Queen. Would have been fine. All right, question three. Well, the World Cup finals are about to kick off in Qatar in the middle of the winter, naturally and in the wake of thousands of deaths of foreign workers brought in to prepare for the tournament. But no matter what happens this time, we can look forward to 2026, when the U.S. co-hosts the tournament with Canada and Mexico. In 1994, when the U.S. first hosted, the opening ceremony reached a crescendo when what singer hilariously missed a penalty kick while singing her 1980 top 10 hit, I'm Coming Out? I think I know this one... Uh... Darren, at least from the song, as long as it's the person who sang that song, then I think we're okay. Okay. We think it might be Diana Ross, but we're not positive who sings that song. This artist has an incredible 
concert, if you go to YouTube, um, where they performed uh, to, uh, I guess you could call it sold out, even though it's not sold out, in Central Park, and it was a torrential downpour, huge uh, just rainstorm that uh, completely ruined the concert, but she continued to sing until they told her to stop, and then she did the concert again for free the next day, and uh, we went, we said Diana Ross. Yep, you got it, and that is, in fact, a great performance in Central Park. It is Diana Ross. Yeah, it's really cool. She's like getting drenched and still singing, and there's a wave mach- or a wind machine on her. It's really cool. She still looks younger than I do right now. Mm-hmm. All right, question number four. In 1989, British author Peter Mayo published a best-selling memoir called A Year in Provence, which told how he had spent a year living in southern France coming up with cutesy stories with which to fill a memoir. The book's success spawned a million and one A Year Of type memoirs. I'm going to give you four of them. Three are real, and one I just made up. Points to you if you can identify the phony one. A, a year of miracles, daily devotions and reflections. B, my soprano's year, living and learning the lessons of America's true first family. C, a year without underwear, exploring the world on a bicycle. And D, eat this book, a year of gorging and glory on the competitive eating circuit. All right, we've locked in with a guess. Uh, it's purely that, I guess, because Dave did a good job. Dave did do a good job, indeed. Uh, where, where are you leaning, uh, Darren? B, because it's so pop culture, I think maybe that would be the off the off one. I, I was thinking the same thing, <laughs> yeah. So, and then D was eat this book. Um I could go with either B or D, but I think D is somewhat plausible to be real. So I, I would guess B, but I have no idea how how flawed my logic is. I was I was between B and and uh, D as well. Um, and like you said, it's pop culture. It could be plausible, but maybe yeah, maybe we go. You're saying that, B. that would also be the easier one to make up. Yeah, too, right. Exactly. What I'm um, so I think we're gonna say B as well. The Sopranos one. And we also said The Sopranos one. Well, uh, there's no getting anything past you guys. That's the one I made up by Sopranos here, living and learning the lessons of America's true first family. Nice. Well, it was hard to suss out, to be honest. Yeah, I think so. that was well written. Yeah, that was a great question. Thank you. <laughs> question five. Which article of clothing, believed to have been invented in the 1940s for military use, did Project Runway's Tim Gunn once shockingly admit to wearing, confessing that it was, in fact, the single least fashionable thing that he owned? All right, we're locked in. I'll tell you what, his Kevlar evening vest to die for. Or not. What, what do you think it could be? I'm trying to think of some military clothing, Darren, that might be... Being a celebrity, he might actually have worn a bulletproof vest, but then later admitted, yeah, it's not fashionable, but I wore it. I mean, we could go with that. Yeah, I'm not coming up with anything else. I mean, I think I remember hearing this, but it's just not coming to me. But um, yeah, if you want to go bulletproof vest. Yeah, I think bulletproof vests have been around a little bit longer than that. But Yeah. All right. Well, we were initially thinking a fanny pack, mm. but at the last minute we switched to cargo pants. Well, technically the answer is uh, something that Tim Gunn owns exactly one more pair of than I do, apparently. Uh, cargo shorts, but I think I'm going to give cargo pants credit on this one. Thank okay. you. <laughs> it's, it's nice. Definitely a very close relative. Yeah, the, the cargo shorts are the worst. The version key of word the cargo is pants. cargo. <laughs> After five in the second round, there are more changes than an ABBA song. It looks like uh, Team The Voice and The Voiceless uh, picking up 30, bringing their total to 120, but taking the lead once again, picking up 50 points, a perfect first five is Sand and Fog, and who are now at 125. As the quiz gets dumber and dumber, it seems like, uh, you know, one team seems to be coming back a little bit. Yeah, thank you very much. (laughs) No problem. Uh, Number six, in 2006, Fiji Springwater got itself into trouble by running an advertising campaign that said, the label says Fiji because it's not bottled in blank. The American city in question, which has long been sensitive about jokes poking fun at its water quality, ran tests showing Fiji's water contained several micrograms of arsenic per liter, while its own tap water was 100% arsenic-free. Which city fought back against these liars at Fiji water? Okay, Darren, I have an idea, but uh, what are you thinking? 
Um, I think it's too early. Uh, it's too early for Flint. So oh, I was thinking Flint if, as well. You don't think it, it's too early for that? Yeah, well, I, I was either thinking Flint or Detroit. Yeah. One of the two, especially for a national campaign. If they were to say it, our water doesn't come from Flint, not everybody would know, except except when the Flint thing actually did happen. So if it happened, if if this is the a campaign happening before that, then it would have to be a larger city in order for that for that campaign to make any sense. So whether it's not whether or not it's Detroit, I don't know. But Michigan, I think of terrible water. I think of Michigan, that part of the state. So. So, Darren, you're you're saying um, that uh, even though we both thought of Flint, maybe we go to a bigger city because 2006 seems a little early for Flint. So, do you want to go just with yeah. Detroit then? That that's just that's my guess. If if you're if it's okay with you, sounds good to me. We yeah. uh, we thought that over, but uh, Jeff had a good idea. Yeah, um, thinking that that crisis was later, and even Fiji wouldn't be so classless as to do that one. Um, we just knew that the Cuyahoga River caught on fire a couple times, and we said Cleveland. The Cleve. Uh, yeah, this is a city known for uh, smoke on the water and flames on the water. This is Cleveland, Ohio. Good job, Jeff. Yeah, good one. Good one. Number seven, which author, a 1961 graduate of NYU, began writing as a bored housewife a few years later and went on to publish over 25 novels, received countless accolades, including the Library of Congress's Living Legends Award, despite having four books on the American Library Association's 2009 list of top 100 banned or challenged books. Okay, someone I think who's had a lot of banned books, but is also a revered writer, uh, beloved, Toni Morrison? First for me. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll try Toni Morrison. I think did we fall into the Maya Angelou Tony Morrison trap uh, again? I say Tony Morrison's also a great guest, um, but we said Maya Angelou also knowing that she was revered and probably, you know, there's certainly people who probably want to ban her books for whatever reason. So, well, this is actually uh, an author primarily of young adult fiction. Uh, the author of "Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret," and "Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing." This is Judy Bloom. Oh, wow! Oh, wow. Question eight. New York founding father, Governor Morris, is well known for serving in the Continental Congress and U.S. Senate and as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. He's less well known for dying in 1816 from an infection after he caused internal injuries while using a bone from what animal of the order Cetacea as a catheter in an attempt to clear a blockage in his own urinary tract? All right, we're going to go ahead and lock in. With something stupid, but it's worth it. So, Darren, is if, cetacea seafood? Yeah, that's possible. Because my first question uh, was going to be: if it, if you were living in 1816, what animal's bone would you use as a catheter? But because it would have to, it would have to be long. It have to be thin. So, so it could be like a fish bone. I like a I fish. Mean, it I like your have to be, but I like it's your easier. I like your fish angle here. Um, 1816. So like a catfish or something like that, because they have. Uh, I think deboned many fish. Or, that sounds like a terrible yeah. idea. How about? I mean, it's what it's New York, right? Maybe some seafood, like you said. So, I maybe the crab, maybe the crab bone or or lobster. No, I'm just trying to think. As the last time I've you know I've eaten crab or lobster or something like that, if there's any if there's any bones that actually qualify for what he used it for. Mm. I'll, I'll give you a hint, guys. Uh, crabs and lobsters have exoskeletons. Ah, uh, right. Oh, what about a turkey bone, like the wishbone or something? Well, I, I thought about that as well, but I didn't. But when he said uh, cetacea, I wasn't sure. Hmm. So, what are we going to go with? What are you picking? I, I trust you. Um, so long as I don't have to get too specific, I just want to say a fishbone. All right, that's fine. Um, and we, I wrote down bald eagle because <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> We're just saying eagle. The birds have hollow bones, so. Yeah, well, uh, you know, some questions you ask uh, because you want people to get the answer, and some questions you ask because you just want to hear them discuss all the wrong answers. Um, <laughs> it, it was the 19th century, and this is an animal that that folks used a lot in the 19th century for uh, heating, lubrication, oh, all sorts. God, of God, a whalebone. A whale. whale bone. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, mine still I'm, came from the sea. Sort of, <laughs> yeah. But, but definitely, definitely what, what whale bone yeah. would you not just completely impale yourself on? <laughs> well, as they Apparently say, sometimes you bone the whale. I'm guessing it was whale whittled down too. a lot. 
<laughs> yeah, the founding founding fathers, uh, I guess, not all uh, so smart. All right, question number nine. 1960s The Magnificent Seven was, of course, based on The Seven Samurai, Akira Kurosawa's classic released only a few years earlier. By most accounts, it was actor Yul Brenner's idea to adapt the samurai film for the Western genre. But in attempting to do so, Brenner ended up in litigation with another actor who claimed it was his idea first. Who was this other actor who was born in Chihuahua, Mexico in 1915 and had a lengthy successful career during the course of which he won two Best Supporting Actor Oscars in the 1950s for Viva Zapata and Lust for Life? It's either it's either Anthony Quinn or um, no, I don't think he won an Oscar. The other guy I'm thinking of. Well, I can't think of any. My brain is kind of mush right now. Do you want to just say Anthony Quinn? That works. Right. Right. Um, this is more. This person's more known as an action star, but maybe some of the early more heavy westerns he was in, um, he might have won some Oscars. We said Charles Bronson. Well, the answer here is someone who uh, won two Best Supporting Actor Oscars, but also was nominated for Best Actor a couple of times, including uh, once for Zorba the Greek. This is Anthony Quinn. Mm, good job, Neil. Oh, wow. Neil. I got to get one one good one in here tonight so that I can go to sleep. Number 10. Speaking of the Oscars, several years ago, I had the pleasure of heading to Film Forum in downtown Manhattan and seeing a fully restored print of a 1966 film by Gilo Pontecorvo. It's the only movie to have been nominated for Academy Awards in two non-consecutive years and is based on events early in the war for independence in which nation, the largest in Africa by area. All right, we are locked in with a little bit of teamwork. Yeah, um, if you're okay with South Africa, I just know that they, they make a lot of films about South Africa and obviously there's a lot shot there now, so maybe it was yeah. about... Uh, yeah, let's go with that. We'll say South Africa. All right. All right. I think probably this film that he's talking about is Zulu. And I said, Jeff, where would this have taken place? And he said, the largest country in Africa. And I said, yeah. And he said, Algeria. Well, this film um, uh, was nominated for Best Foreign Language Film in 1967 and then for Screenplay and Director in 1969. Uh, title of the film, you notice I didn't say because the title of this really excellent film is Battle for Algiers. Uh, which tells the story of the early stages of the independence war in Algeria. So we got it for the wrong reasons, but I'm happy. Nice. Well, I got it for the only reasons I know. So I think right. Zulu is Jeff with... is smart. I am dumb. I know. I was a little worried. I thought it was maybe. Dumb. I figured it was nominated two years in a row because it takes that long to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zulu, I believe, is Sean Connery and Michael Caine. I think could be wrong. Um, or no, maybe I'm thinking of the war. Of the well, anyway, something with a flower. But at the end of regulation, um, the team of Sand and Fog uh, was doing really well in the first half, but only picked up 20 points in the second half, bringing their total to 145, which means they are just in reach for Team The Voice and The Voices, who only picked up 10 points and are at 130. So it's only 15 points um, separating each team. That's a very close game. Let's have the categories for the final. Sure. So as uh, I mentioned earlier, the World Cup's coming up. I'm a big soccer fan, so... Um, the five categories uh, here in the final round are going to be group stage, round of 16, quarterfinal, semifinal, and final. All right, the wagers are in. It looks like um, Voice and the Voiceless are betting zeros, uh, hoping that we miss more than we get as we wagered just 15 on all of them. So we'll see what happens. It has been a winning strategy before. Let's see if it'll it's, pay off for them this is time. Is it possible that we get a tie? I think it's possible. All right, well, let's see. Question one, group stage. According to the American Kennel Club, dogs in which group were, quote, bred to assist hunters in the capture and retrieval of feathered game? Question two, round of 16. On Ringo Starr's wildly creepy 1973 number one hit, You're 16, which multi-instrumentalist is credited with a kazoo solo? Question three, quarterfinal. The Fourth Man is the title of a short story by Agatha Christie, first published in the 1933 collection The Hound of Death. What was Agatha Christie's real last name? Number four, semifinal. 
In the men's semifinal of the 2022 Wimbledon Championships, Novak Djokovic defeated Nick Kyrgios to reach his 32nd Grand Slam final, surpassing the all-time record that he had jointly held with whom? And question five, final. According to the tastemakers at AARP.org, the best ever television finale was the last episode of which series, which ends with a couple going back to sleep? All right, we have the questions. We'll be right back and see who can take the cream of the crop. There are really many reasons to listen to our podcast, Big Picture Science. It's kind of a challenge to summarize them all, Molly. Okay, here's a reason to listen to our show, Big Picture Science, because you love to be surprised by science news. We love to be surprised by science news. So, for instance, I learned on our own show that I had been driving around with precious metals in my truck before it was stolen. That was brought up in our show about precious metals and also rare metals, like most of the things in your catalytic converter. I was surprised to learn that we may begin naming heat waves like we do hurricanes. You know, prepare yourself for heat wave Lucifer. I don't think I can prepare myself for that. Look, we like surprising our listeners. We like surprising ourselves by reporting new developments in science and while asking the big picture questions about why they matter and how they will affect our lives today and in the future. Well, we can't affect lives in the past, right? No, I I guess that's a point. (laughs) So the podcast is called Big Picture Science and You can hear it wherever you get your podcasts. We are the hosts. Seth is a scientist. I'm a science journalist. And we talk to people smarter than us. We hope you'll take a listen. Have you ever wondered what really happened to Amelia Earhart or the lost colony of Roanoke? Do you ever find yourself scouring the internet for vicious Victorians and their murders by gaslight? Or perhaps... You're just sick and tired of women being constantly misrepresented or plain lied about throughout history. If so, join me, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books on Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, part of the Area of Media Network, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. Adios, au revoir, au revoir, zen, my friends. Bye-bye. I'll be seeing you. We are back with our answers. Let's have the questions one more time and see how we did. Sure. Question one, according to the American Kennel Club, dogs in which group were bred to assist hunters in the capture and retrieval of feathered game? So I was like, retrievers? And Jeff said there's a special category for this. I thought they were the sporting dogs. So that's what we guessed. Well, I, I had heard at one point, uh, at least I be, I think I heard at one point, that poodles were actually bred uh, for hunting dogs, uh, which surprised me because that would have been like the last breed I would have thought of. But I didn't, I don't know if he was actually asking for the breed of dog on this question or not, but that's, that's what popped into my head. So the, the answer here is, in fact, the sporting group. Mm. Good job, Jeff. I can tell you um, that our golden doodle, you know, part golden retriever, part poodle, uh, does not retrieve. Okay. (laughs) And and by the way, I think poodles were uh, specifically bred to annoy my dog. Oh, okay. (laughs) So I was probably wrong on what I heard then. Yeah. No, I mean, you might you might have been right, but I can tell you that mine doesn't do those things. All right, question two, uh, category was round of 16. On Ringo Starr's wildly creepy 1973 number one hit, You're 16, which multi-instrumentalist is credited with a kazoo solo? Uh, we said Prince. That's a good, great guess. Um, yeah, Darren and I were, were talking. We said maybe it is a, uh, a Beatle. Maybe one of his friends came over. We couldn't remember if they had broken up at this time. And um, we were thinking maybe it's uh, Sir Paul McCartney. Did you see Paul jamming out on kazoo. Uh, well, the answer here, although I think it may actually not be a kazoo, um, but the credit for the kazoo solo nevertheless goes to, in fact, Sir Paul McCartney. Mm. Wow. Nice to done. Fun fact on this one, if you, um, there's an early music video for the song from like the mid 70s. Uh, and uh, in that one, the object of Ringo's lechery is a very young Carrie Fisher. Oh, wow. Um, question three, quarterfinal. 
The Fourth Man is the title of a short story by Agatha Christie, first published in the 1933 collection, The Hound of Death. What was Agatha Christie's real last name? We don't know at all. So we said Kensington. It's a good guess. Um, so I think there's a little bit of trickery here from Dave. Um, Agatha Christie, she married Archibald Christie, uh, who was a, a veteran and um, didn't have a good marriage, but she got famous when uh, she had that last name, so she kept it. So she was Agatha Christie her rest of her life. She married Max Mallowan, an archaeologist, didn't take his name. Um, her maiden name was Miller, but she never had a pseudonym other than Mary Westmacott that she wrote romance novels under. So her real name would be Agatha Christie. Yep, I thought uh, it was a pseudonym when I started writing this question, and uh, it turns out I was totally wrong about that and thought maybe if I was wrong about that, some other people would be wrong about that, and I've been proven correct. The answer is Christy, uh, and her married name was was Miller. Um, it, Neil, if you guys had wagered any points, I would be obligated to give you bonus points at this point. That's all right. We'll pat ourselves on the back. It was all Darren. The way it's looking yeah, right we'll, now is not so we'll good take for zero us. So times that, two. <laughs> the zero route may be the right route. So if we get both of these right, we win. Mm -hmm. If we get one more of these right, we tie. Oh, wow. If we get neither of them right, we you lose. win. Oh, wow. This is intense. <laughs> no pressure. All right. Number four, semifinal. Men's semifinal of the 2022 Wimbledon Championships. Novak Djokovic beat Nick Kyrgios to reach his 32nd Grand Slam final, surpassing the all-time record that he had jointly held with whom? hope we're right um it was kind of between in my head rafael nadal and roger federer and we said roger federer Ooh, i forgot about federer um we just thought maybe it was nadal because they're always kind of lockstep so we said nadal the answer here is the man from switzerland roger federer <laughs> and number five in the category of final according to the tastemakers at aarp.org the best ever television finale was the last episode of which series, which ends with a couple going back to sleep. So there was a little bit of uh, discussion here because we know that the plot of this revolves around two shows uh, starring Bob Newhart. And we went with the Bob Newhart show. You can go ahead, Darren. Uh, actually, if I remember correctly, the Bob Newhart show was the first one. No. The original and Newhart was the follow up his his second show, and it was the it was at the end of Newhart that he ended up waking up with Suzanne Plachette from the Bob Newhart show. And Darren, you could not possibly be any more correct. You're 100 percent correct. The answer is Newhart. So losing 15 points on that final round makes us tie with you at what? 130. All right. Uh, Dave, do you have a tiebreaker prepared? Well, uh, yes, I do, in fact. Uh, and here is that tiebreak question. So whoever gets closest to the correct number here will win all the marbles. How many votes did Lula da Silva receive in the recent Brazilian presidential election? Yeah, how about we say 11,923,000? Sure. All right. Okay. I, I like what I'm hearing. Um, we said 45 million. Well, the correct answer, uh, gentlemen, is 60 million, 345,999. Wow. What I write on my paper? Ken originally wrote 60 million, and I didn't think that many people turned out. Wow. Yeah, they have huge. That's incredible. There. All right. Well, it's been something like 200 episodes since we had a tie, but in this tie, it turns out that the sand and the fog are today's cream of the crop. In you, Triviality, I'm talking to you. You know that I'm the cream of the crop. Well done. Great game. Wow. Thank you so much, that was guys. Hard. My right brain to the end. hurts. Great game. Wow. We were in it till the end, Darren. That's all that matters. I, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm very surprised that we got that close. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I even emailed you before this, going, "Are you really sure you want to do this?" Because I know nothing about everything. Yeah, we're, we're real we're sure, positive. <laughs> yeah, we, we we did a great job. You did a great job specifically, and uh, Darren, we're just so honored that you were here with us today, um, getting to uh, spread the love and and uh, give the listeners what they want. They've been clamoring for you to be on. That's no joke. We've gotten emails and messages. We want Darren on the podcast, and, and you're here. 
Um, so thank you very well, much. You're for... never going to get those emails ever again after this show. <laughs> after, after this, oh my gosh, he was know, awful. Don't ever have off. him on ever again. <laughs> well, just thank you so much <laughs> for joining us. Laughing at all of my answers. Uh, no, you did a wonderful job. Um, please tell everyone where they can find you uh, and uh, what where they can listen to you and all that good stuff. Yeah, well, um, I do a podcast called Weird Darkness about the paranormal, supernatural, true crime, cryptids, uh, extraterrestrials, all, all the strange and macabre stuff. And I do that every day. It's at WeirdDarkness.com. Also, of course, wherever you find podcasts, just look for Weird Darkness. And uh, you were very kind earlier to uh, to mention if they wanted to hire me for voiceover stuff. Same place. Just There's a, there's a page there at WeirdDarkness.com where you can just click on it and learn more about what I do and how to hire me. If you want me to be your movie trailer guy or whatever. That sells itself right there. There you go. Well, uh, everyone, please check out Darren's work. And uh, he already said that maybe we'll get him to uh, do an altered rules reader or, or something fun for 2023 to celebrate. Uh, Happy 300. to come back. Uh, oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, Dave, always a pleasure to see you. Uh, we've been talking about uh, doing something in Brooklyn together. Maybe we'll get uh, Joe Wen involved as well. But uh, tell people where they can find you uh, and any other uh, shout outs you'd like to give. Well, first of all, I want to say it's nice to meet Darren. And, you know, for a long time listener of the podcast has been a real uh, look behind the curtain type of experience for me. Um, I, uh, as I said earlier, my buddy Zach and I run the quiz every other Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, at the Sackett Bar in Park Slope, Brooklyn on Sackett Street near 4th Avenue. Uh, come by. Uh, I'll bring you uh, some prizes. You can win some drinks. You can win some money. You can win some Japanese candy sometimes. Mm, that sounds delicious. And just want to remind everybody that we are also part of a delicious podcast network where you can find such podcasts as Ben Franklin's World, Big Picture Science, and Baby Led Weaning Made Easy for the New Mothers out there uh, on Airwave Media. And uh, for all our special guests, Darren and Dave, and for Jeff, Ken, and Matt, who is still looking for Brendan Fraser, my name is Neil, and that was Triviality. Triviality.